Good morning, folks. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, on behalf of the National Park Service, Gettysburg National Military Park, and the American people, I'd like to welcome you folks to said park and specifically to the 11 o'clock Little Round Top program. My name is Scott Adrian. Obviously, I am a park ranger and I'm wearing my green and gray for the last time. I am officially, when we finish this program, folks, I am officially retired. Welcome. So thank you for participating in my final hurrah. Uh, I got permission from the chief, from the senior, from the chief historian, uh, to make this program as long as you people will put up with me. <laughs> it's scheduled to be an hour program. Uh, I have gone ahead and gotten permission to do a full battle walk, which is up to two and a half to three hours. I don't think we'll make it that far. I don't have that much material. I need to make this honest and upfront. Of course, most of you guys here are ringers. Uh, friends and colleagues, but uh, which I deeply appreciate. And uh, anyway, uh, the old adage, you know, you're welcome to break off at any time. So let's not let's not be, uh, let's not beat that to a point. Uh, I've also got my good friend and uh, volunteer of the park here, John Popel, <clears throat> agreeing to help me and be my picture guy. And uh, we have, John and I have traversed this battlefield together uh, many times over the last six years, and we're definitely sidekicks. So we'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, how many people here first for the first time? Two. Okay, that's, uh, that's not bad. What I'd like to do then is go ahead and point out uh, the, uh, the quick safety messages first. As you can see, uh, it's pretty, a lot of trip hazards around here, so we're going to be navigating some rather uh, tricky spots, so just be, please be careful. Uh, preservation messages. Um, you've heard them before. Same as you've been out to Yellowstone, you've been other places. Take nothing but memories, leave nothing but footsteps, please. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I can remember from my first trip back here to Gettysburg some 50-some oh, odd years ago now is that the park was very, very friendly about letting visitors uh, do what they wanted, so to speak. And then they, the visitor would say, well, great-great-grandpappy was with the 4th Texas. Can I try to run up a little round top? And we would say, sure, go ahead, have a great time. Well, unfortunately, we've had this, to stop that because... Uh, in addition to what has happened the, uh, with the release of the movie Gettysburg, I can remember my first trip, trip back here, there's a lot more green and not as much dirt. And it's an environmental issue where we had to do something or we were going to lose it. We're basically talking about environmental hazards here as far as erosion and things of that nature. And so basically we ask that you try to stay on the paths. Uh, there are some walking trails down to monuments and things like that. So you can definitely take those. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we won't let you start at the bottom and run up like great, great, great grandpappy may have tried. So, and, I got, and looking around what I see in the crowd, I don't see too many people that will probably be very interested in doing that, even though it's not as hot as it was back on the, third, on the 2nd of July of 1863. We rangers are supposed to develop an idea that we'll put through on our programs to help guide you through them. The one that I chose for this particular program is, the, is one that deals with the fickleness of history. Going back to that first trip to Gettysburg, if you stopped an average visitor on the field or downtown Gettysburg and asked, who's the hero of Little Round Top? It'd be this gentleman right here. Governor Warren, the engineer of the Army of the Potomac. But if you do the same thing today, you would get a different answer some 60 years later. Nobody knows who Governor Warren is today, and now it's all Joshua Chamberlain. 
And so history is a very, very fickle mistress. And what I would like us to do on our walk, however long it, it lasts, it's not going to be any more than two hours. I can guarantee you that. I don't think Matt's got more t t tape than that. But anyway, is to try to figure out ourselves who we think the real history, the real hero of Little Round Top is. And so to start with that, what I'd like to do is get, get us everybody oriented, especially for you folks who've been here for the first time. If you look to your to our right, and there's a notch in, all the way down on the horizon, there's a notch in the trees with a, with a green water tower in it. Does everybody see that? That green water tower, that's Cemetery Hill. That is the curve of the Union fish hook. Does everybody know what I refer to when I talk about the Union fish hook? That's the curve of the fish hook. Uh, coming up a little bit further, you'll see the dome for the Pennsylvania Monument. That's the shaft or shank of the Union fish hook. And the ring of that fish hook, where you string that good 60 pound test, if you want to go out into the Chesapeake Bay after stripers, and it's time, is going to be right here where we're standing on the round tops. Two and a half to three miles, point to point. Nice, good, tight internal lines of communication. And the Federals pack it with artillery. Now on the other side, we can see in front of General Warren's statue here across the way, does everybody see the thing that looks like a fire tower? That's the Longstreet Tower. And that marks the spot. It also marks the right flank, of, or excuse me, the left flank of Pickett's Division on day three. But on day, t day two, that is where Longstreet's Division, excuse me, Longstreet's Corps, First Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia, is going to wind up and then stretch on down further. Lee's plan on day two is to roll up the left flank of the Union line. Out there on the horizon, you can see, I see the car headed from left to right. That is the Emmitsburg Road. That's the old US 15. That is the road that the federal troops came up to this spot on day one. Lee wants Longstreet to attack the federal line parallel to the Emmitsburg Road and then roll up that left flank like a carpet. He's got some bad staff work going on this part of the battle. He details a couple of his junior engineers on the morning of the 1st before it's even light to try to find the extreme left flank of the Yankee line and report back to him. Now his cavalry, under Stuart, still hasn't shown up. Basically, he's still leaving him blind. So his engineers try to fill in, and they report back to him. They've made it all the way to the high ground here at the Round Tops, and they can find no Yankees. Mistake number, number umpty frats. The man must have been blind, or he didn't go as far as he thought he did. I choose to believe that he did not get as far as he thought. And the, the attack was to, like I said, to attack parallel with his two divisions under General Hood and General McClaws and roll up the Yankee line. General Hood, Division Command, and then General, go ahead, John, next one, next two, as a matter of fact. General Roberson, his Texas Brigade, that's Hood's old brigade. The first, third, excuse me, first, fourth, fifth, 
Texas, and the third Arkansas. The Alabama, Alabamians under Evander Law, fourth, 15th, 47th, 48th, and 44th Alabama. And there to attack up parallel to the Emmitsburg Road. Jumping around, jumping around a little bit. The Confederates are going to attack off to the left as the as the tree line, the second tree line that is Seminary Ridge. That's where the Confederates are going to be uh, hanging out. And then as it starts making a curve towards the towards our left, that's where it switches off to Warfield Ridge. And that's where the attack is going to start around 3.30 in the afternoon. This part of the battle I refer to as the crucible. If anybody has seen my YouTube presentation on Devil's Den, you'll understand what I'm talking about. If you haven't, crucible is defined as a violent, strong test of wills. And that's basically what happens here. General Sickles has been given the orders by General Meade to extend the federal line from the end of the Pennsylvania Monument down here to cover the round tops. Now he's got about 9,000 men. Two divisions. He's got about 9,000 men. He's got about 9,000 men. He doesn't like those orders. He's concerned about the high ground in front of us at Devil's Den. And then further over in the Peach Orchard, Hawks Ridge, the extension of Devil's Den. He doesn't want to abandon the Emmitsburg Road to the Confederates. And he tries to get Meade's attention. And Meade is busy thinking offensively and basically tells him, just shut up and do what I tell you to do and leave me alone. There is no love lost between the two men. Just a couple of weeks before the battle, they were basically equals. They were both corps commanders. But now, President Lincoln has appointed General Meade is charge of the Army of the Potomac, and Sickles is his only non-West Point graduate in charge of a federal corps. Put it to you bluntly, folks, he is the product of a the Democratic political machine, Tammany Hall, out of New York City, with all the ramification, negative ramifications that means. He is a political hack. He's the first man to cop an insanity plea on a murder charge and get away with it. It just so happens I'm not too fond of Diane Sickles because the man he blew away was my wife's cousin. Anyway, so we have this loose cannon in charge of a federal corps and he's trying to convince everybody that he's right and the commanding general is wrong. And General, even General Hunt, who's in charge of the Federal Artillery, comes up here and he says, Hunt, don't you think that is a great place for a piece of our, for an, as an artillery platform? And Sickles says, and Hunt says, of course it does. I'm not stupid. And then Sickles says, well, based on that, I'm going to go ahead and move my corps. And Hunt says, wait a minute, uh-uh. Not in my recognizance you don't. You go talk to the commanding general. but he can't get Meade's attention. Now I blame Meade a little bit on this, is that he knew what a loose cannon Sickles was, and he probably should have paid a little bit more attention to him, given him a little bit more supervision. But he didn't. And so finally, Meade, I mean Sickles moves his corps 
about three quarters of a mile further to the west than Meade wants it. And you're going to take up a line on top of Devil's Den, Hawks Ridge, and then over at the Page Orchard. He complained he didn't have enough men to occupy the line here, but he had even less to occupy what he took up. And at that point in time, that's Longstreet and his two divisions start making their attack to roll up the left flank of the Yankee line. I've got a quote for you. That's General Warren, Chief Engineer, Army of the Potomac. Around 2.30, 3 o'clock, Meade calls him and says, Warren, I hear a little peppering going on in the direction of Little Hill off yonder. I wish that you would ride over and have anything serious is going on. Attend to it. So, Warren does exactly that. And he rides down here and he comes up the same path basically we did. And that rock right behind the lady here, you can see the plaque on the other side, is a plaque dedicated to the Signal Corps. There's a couple of signalmen and they're folding up their signal flags. And General Warren says, hey guys, where are you going? He says, we're pulling back. There's Rebs out there. And he says, where? And they say, right over there, General. I don't see anything. Well, they're right over there. And so he hops on top of the rock, pulls out his glasses, and by God, they're right. There's Hood's whole division, 7,400 men coming across that field. And guess what? They've outflanked Sickles' line at the Devil's Den here. They've gotten around the left flank of the Union line with some of the best troops in the Confederate Army. I just want to see what you're on. Okay. All right. One of the things that Meade did when he gave Warren those orders is he invested him with the authority of the commanding general. So when he makes a request or gives an order, it's the same thing as me doing it. We need to get some troops up here and get them up quick. And he dispatches his aides. Need to find some troops. In the meantime, General Sykes in the Fifth Corps is starting to come up from the south. Go ahead. Colonel Vincent, Cork, uh, brigade commander of the 3rd Brigade of the 1st Division of the 5th Corps, is riding ahead. He'd been, he had been ordered to support General, Sick, General Sickles' line. And Warren had found the division commander, General Barnes, and uh, asked him for one of his brigades. Well, that courier is dispatched, is running and riding back trying to get one of those brigades. And Colonel Strong Vincent intercepts him and says, What are your orders? I need to find General Barnes. What are your orders? My orders are to send troops to occupy, have General Barnes send troops to occupy the ground, the high ground off yonder. And Vincent will take, tell you find General Barnes, you tell him that on my own recognizance, I will take my brigade to that spot. And he turns command of the brigade over to his, over to Colonel Rice. Uh, I'll show you the picture of that when it's appropriate. And then who are the 44th New York? And he rides ahead to spot the line of his troops. 
Now, most folks, when they come up here, know about Joshua Chamberlain and the 20th Maine. I always like to remind folks there were three other regiments up here also, commanded by Colonel Vincent. There was, a, there was the 44th New York, commanded by Colonel Rice. There was the 83rd Pennsylvania, which is, was originally commanded by, by Colonel Vincent until he gets promoted to brigade command. And then there's those, there's Joshua Chamberlain and his rookies from the 20th Maine. And then you have those tenacious Wolverines from my home state of Michigan, <laughs> the 16th under Lieutenant Colonel Noble Welsh. And as, as uh, Vincent is riding along, he's thinking where he's going, he's observing the territory, and he's going to try to determine where is he going to place his troops. And what we're going to do now, folks, is that we're going to walk along the crest of the hill uh, over towards where the, some of the monuments are that we need to talk about. And as we're walking along, I'd like you guys to consider if you were Colonel Vincent, where would you place your troops and why? Follow me, please. Okay. One of the reasons I stop here is to point out uh, these. Uh, these guns belong to Bat Hazlitt's battery, Battery D, 5th U.S. Artillery. And um, they were not here at this point in time. They do get eventually get up here, but I'd like you to look off to uh, our right. And what you see down there is the parking lot. These are horse-drawn weapons. But the slopes are so steep that the gunners are afraid of a horse breaking its leg. And so these guns are manhandled by the gun crews up the slopes and placed in line. Now, one of the things that I'm going to be doing in retirement is rejoining the artillery battery I left 10 years ago when I came to start to work for the Park, park Service. On the side, I am a certified Civil War gunner with one of these. This is one of my babies. This is a 10-pound parrot. You can always tell it's a parrot because of the wrought iron band around the breech of the weapon. This is a rifled piece. This rifling inside the barrel makes the shell more accurate. The range on these things was up to probably about two miles. But if you notice off to the left, as you get close in a frontal assault, these guns really can't be depressed low enough to really have any major effect. But Lieutenant Hazlitt, before he's killed, does make, this, does make the statement that the noise and the shock from the concussions of my guns firing will give encouragement to the men fighting below. And just because it's not gonna help out Vincent's brigade it doesn't mean it won't help the Third Corps boys over on Devil's Den, which it does. Those shells flying over the place will help impact it against some of the Confederates attacking along the line of Devil's Den there. Vincent rides ahead. Now, one of the things that always confused me when I, as a kid when I first came here is I couldn't understand why all the monuments were here at the end and not straight. And the reason is, duh, is because they didn't come over the top of Devil's Den. They came through the slaughter pen off to the left. 
that you have the rocks and doubles den, you have the tour road, and then you have a bunch of boulders down off to the left there, and then uh, extending towards the left. That's known as a slaughter pen. It's a natural defile. It's also the, the creek bed for the Plum Run, which by the time this battle is well underway is running absolutely red with blood. So you have elements of the 4th Texas, the 5th Texas, the 4th Alabama, and the 47th Alabama, and the 4th Alabama. They're coming through the signal pen, through the slaughter pen. They're not being stopped by the, by the Federals on the, uh, in the rocks, which is the 4th Maine. And they're gathering towards here, and they're going to heading towards the high ground. John, go ahead and put the map up. And basically, the map will help. I don't know if how... Uh, how well you guys can see this. But basically, that explains what happens. The Reds, the Reds are Confederate. Okay, Vincent is deploying his line, has deployed his line. 16th Michigan, right here, right here, the rectangular monument. The, 80, the 44th on their flank. Down on the other side in the woods is the 83rd. And then he's going to stick his rookies the 20th Maine at the end of the line. And we'll get to that, back to that in a minute. He does that on purpose. Now, can anybody hazard a guess why he placed the troops where he did? Any former infantry guys in the crowd? They're, down, they're halfway down the hill. There's something that would not be on top of the hill. Yeah. You don't want your troops on the crest, because you'd be silhouetted against the, against the skylight. You want your troops on what's called the military crest, which is a little bit further on down. Military tactics have totally changed in the last 150 years. If this was a modern battle, what, where the commander would place his troops is on the reverse slope, and he'd call in missile strikes, or helicopter gunships, and keep his troops well protected behind the outside the range of fire. But that's not civil war. You have to be up front, close, and personal. But you don't want, you don't want your troops outlined against the sun and become targets. And now, there's still two more Confederate regiments. You get the 47th Alabama, and you got the 15th under Colonel Oates, and part of a Law's Brigade. They are not coming through the slaughter pen. They're coming over the crest of Big Round Top, which is right out to our front. The 40s, the 50, now the 15th Alabama is the one that eventually tangles with Joshua Chamberlain in the 20th. Almost 500 men in the regiment. Well commanded by Colonel Oates. We'll talk about that when the time comes. Okay. <clears throat> Where, where am I, where am I, okay. So, the Confederates are coming up. Basically, it's the 4th Texas, 5th Texas, and then 4th Alabama. And they're not even aware the Yankees are here. And they start coming up, the, they start coming up the rocks, literally. Vincent gets his troops here just in time to get into line, deploy, and Start shooting. What about the guys in Devil's Den? Wouldn't they have seen them come up there? They saw them come up, but their hands are tied. They would, they would, they would um, engage them somewhat, but there, there were uh, as they went through the slaughter pen. But they're also being attacked by troops to their front. Gotcha. Okay. Twenty-two hundred men against seventy-four hundred. And so their, 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 hands, their hands are somewhat tied. They can, only do, they can only do so much. The 4th Maine is not much more than about two to 250 to 300 men. Now, they got the advantage of being inside defensive positions inside the rocks. You can't get to them, but there's more, more Confederates slipping past them as they're trying to slow that stuff, to slow the attack down. Is this making sense? Okay. All right, what's, 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 what we'll, we'll get next, John? Another map. Okay, so that's what happens first. And this happens several times, two or three times. And, what, uh, and then the, the, the Confederates figure out the Yankees are up here, 
And one of the things that starts to happen is it's the reverse of what happens on the other side where Oates and the 15th Alabama tries to get around the, right fl uh, the left flank. It's, they're stretching the lines trying to get around the right flank of the 16th Michigan, the smallest regiment in the brigade, 165 men. 40 men, 50 men are on the skirmish line. That knocks it down to about 100. Now, these men are veterans. They've been in the service since September of 61. But they're outnumbered. And they only stretch so far. And the 44th New York here fires obliquely across their lines, trying to give them support. And then all of a sudden, something happens. The 16th Maine, the, the colors and the color guard and about 45 men retreat to the high ground where we went. Colonel Welsh claims in his battle report that one of the Brigadier Generals, either General Weed or one of the other generals here gave them the order to fall back. This is one of those discrepancies. There was no Brigadier General in the area. You read his official report. As he blames it on one of his, he blames the pullback on one of his company commanders. He claims he disobeyed orders. It's one of those things we just can't explain. I have been to the State Archives in Lansing. I have pulled everything that I can think of for the official reports, and it just doesn't make sense what happened. Eventually, the bottom line is that about half the regiment did, re did pull back. And this is just about when the line is ready to crack. And those Texans are ready to pour in. In the meantime, General Warren has found some help. He runs into a regiment from the 2nd Brigade of the 5th Corps, 1st Division, General Weed's Brigade. And the man commanding that regiment is Patty O'Rourke, Patrick O'Rourke, 1861 graduate of, the West, of West Point, and up until about six months before that, his uh, he had when he got his commission as a second lieutenant as a as a second lieutenant in the regular army, he continued into the service for a while and then was given a temporary uh, promotion in the in the volunteers and given command of the 140th New York Infantry, brand new unit. And his first brigade commander was Governor Warren. So Warren rides up to him and says, Patty, give me your regiment. I've got orders to report to General Sickles. Patty, on my recognizance, give me your regiment. Yes, sir. And Warren personally leads the 140th up to the high ground and two companies Company G in the lead with Colonel O'Rourke compounding down that slope we walked down just as the 16th Michigan is ready to break. And this gives those, those Wolverines the support they need. There's club muskets, there's fist fights, there's kicking, there's screaming, there's punching. O'Rourke is immediately killed coming down the slope. He's in the lead. He's leading his, he's where he belongs. He's leading his regiment. And his monument for the 40th, 140th New York is over there. It's one of the two monuments on the bottle hill that gets polished. Everybody goes up and rubs Patty's nose, look the Irish. And the other is the shoulder on, on Abe's statue outside the visitor center. Everybody takes pictures. Okay, and this turns the fighting around.
the line here is secure. But we still got Joshua and his rookies. And that's the fourth time I've used that term. And it's time for me to explain it. They were, not to take anything away from them. But the 83rd, the 44th, and the 16th had been in the service for two to three years at this point, or between two and a half to three years at this point in time. The 20th Maine comes into service in the summer of 1862. They miss Second Manassas. They're held in reserve at Antietam. The whole Fifth Corps is. They see the elephant at Fredericksburg. Take some pretty heavy casualties. And then they miss Chancellorsville because they're being inoculated against smallpox and the whole regiment's in quarantine. So while they they still got 358, 358 men to the regiment. They've had one good fight under, under their belt, but they don't have the experience the rest of the brigade does. And so Vincent wants to put his best foot forward, and he's running a risk here. Yes, there's nobody on, on Chamberlain's flank. If the Confederates can get, if the Rebs can get around Chamberlain's flank, then they're in the rear of the Union Army. But he figures his three veteran regiments can prevent that from happening. It just so happens that it works out the other way. So at this point in time, we're going to go ahead and uh, we'll start walking around. And uh, let's go check out uh, what's going on with... Uh, take you around the monuments and uh, see what's going on with uh, Joshua in the 20th. Um, 83rd Pennsylvania uh, holds, uh, as I said, that was uh, uh, Vincent's, uh, Vincent's regiment. It holds a dubious claim as being the, uh, the regiment that suffered the highest most, second highest most uh, killed and mortally wounded of any regiment in the Civil War. Union Regiment of the Civil War. See Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania. 83rd Pennsylvania. Number one regiment is the 5th New Hampshire. And they're in the, they're over, they're over in the, uh, they're over in the wheat field. You're talking about the whole war, though. Whole war, yeah. Most, most killed and mortally wounded. Sometimes it's a little difficult to talk about this stuff. You have to do it kind of piecemeal. When Vincent sees the 16th Michigan pulling back, right as Patty and his two companies of the 140th are getting ready, or New York are getting ready to make that charge, he jumps to the top of this rock, exposing himself, trying to rally those, those Wolverines. And of course, he's mortally wounded. And is taken to the rear where he dies about a week later. He does survive long enough to learn that, he, that his promotion to Brigadier General and the volunteers has come through. And so he dies as a Brigadier General based on his actions here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and um, you can see the signs there for the land, uh, the uh, Landscape restoration. Morning. Morning. How are you? Good. 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 Step off to the side for a moment, please, folks. This is a very good documentation right here of what I was talking about earlier about, about, uh, about erosion and uh, what we have to do. I can remember, like I said, my first trip here, this was all green. 
this is all this is all growth and and now and basically this has only happened uh since the release of the movie i mean ed has done tremendous things to increase interest in gettysburg but also we have this also we have this this problem with the, with the erosion so we had to do something otherwise this is going to erode away just absolutely nothing don't forget even after the battle before the park was even established there was a lot of awful lot of commercial development up here there was an amusement park there was a photographic studio there was a brothel <laughs> right up here at little round top and now how much of the woods would have been here and not here what what have, what tree cover would have been here uh, there was tree cover there there was some tree cover but not as much as big round top because the landowner that owned this property cut his trees and sold them to the two brickyards in town to make charcoal. So what we see here would have been... Uh, there would have been a whole lot less right. because of the open range uh, farming, there been a whole lot less undergrowth. So it would have been much easier for New Warren to come up here and, and actually get a much better view. Exactly, of good point. Stopping right here for over here folks. I walked you down here specifically So you could take a look at some of these breastworks This is some of the defenses that were built by the by the uh, by uh, oh, It's gonna be Rice's brigade because uh, um, Vincent's dead uh, on day three those were the actual, those were remnants of the actual breastworks from, but they weren't here uh, on the second. They were, they were built on the evening of the second or on the third. What about the stone wall? Stone wall was probably not here. That's probably been placed later. Vincent posts them. He sends Captain Merle down here with his company B. And they would have been on the other side of the wall. I, I checked this, Pat. They've been on the other side of the wall. It's getting a little bit ahead of myself, but uh, it all ties together. They're down here, and all of a sudden flitting through the trees, and now the leaves are down, you can see it. They see some green movement. And they wonder, what the hell is this? It's 12 sharpshooters from Company B, of the second U.S. Sharpshooter, Major Houghton's unit, and they're coming over from the top of the big round top, about 12 of them. And they've been taking pot shots at the 47th Alabama and the, and the 15th as they're making their attack across the place. And they come, hey guys, can we join you? Sure, more the merrier. I mean, they can pull, you guys can put out 10 rounds to R1. We'd love to have you. And so they do. And then you don't hear too much from them for a while. Now, there's a new professor that I'm talking about, Professor Lewis Getz from, like I said, University of, uh, University of Illinois at, Sher at Urbana-Champaign, talks about after the fifth or sixth attack, these boys start taking pot shots, especially the sharpshooters, start taking pot shots at Oates' boys up on the slope there. And when whoever orders the bayonet charge or whatever happens, those, those Confederates start coming down here, Captain Merrill and his men open up. And now the Confederates think they've been surrounded. Again, a little, getting a little bit ahead of myself, but that's important to talk about here. Where is the other 20th Maine? They're up on the slope. They're up over here? Up over here, basically, yeah. Okay. They're up over here. And what we're going to do now is walk back to the road, and then we're going to... Uh, so how big was the company? Probably, I'm going to say, probably, I'm going to say 75, 80 men. There's probably a, 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 a number count, but I just don't didn't think yeah. to bring it. Just curious. Yeah, uh, the average average size was between, between uh, 83 and 102. Right. But this was his largest company. <clears throat> Questions? Anything? Questions? Anything? All right. 
upwards and outwards. Pretty much. Uh, just about 500. 500? Uh, no, I, I take that back. Uh, probably around uh, 450. Uh, approximately 500 men in the regiment. One of the things that happens is that uh, there is a uh, water detail. There's 11 men, one from each regiment, that are sent out with canteens to try to find fresh water. And the order to move out comes before the water detail gets back. Okay. They get down here, and they, as they're coming down off the slope of Big Round Top, they see a bunch of ordnance wagons sitting back there by where, where Morrow was. But he's not down there yet. And that's the ordnance wagons for Hazlitt's battery. And they're gonna go try to catch it, capture it. Well, it's just when Morrow shows up. And they're outnumbered. They run them off. And so, and then the sharpshooters show up and they help run them off. Again, 10 shots to one. So, Company A just kind of hunkers down and get, occupies the position. So he's got about 450 men making the assault. Okay, stop here for a second, folks. Well, they cleaned the wayside, they did a good job. Vincent and Chamberlain. Vincent's posting the 20th Maine as they're coming up. Real good, uh, who, who did this painting? Uh, Rocco, it's a, yeah, I thought it was a Rocco. He does good work, but anyways. Alrighty. Wait, Basically, we didn't know. Well, basically what's going on is that Meade is forced to rob Peter to pay Paul. He's pulled half or three quarters of the 12th Corps off Culp's Hill. He sent a bunch of troops from the 2nd Corps down to, he pull, down to, uh, he pulled Willard's whole brigade to stop Barksdale. And then he has also pulled Doubleday's division from the 1st Corps down from the cemetery to help pick up some of the slack. Okay, so there's the, you're right, there is reinforcement there, but it's done not all at the same time. Right. And some of those troops that are pulled down are then returned back to where they belong. So Willard's brigade goes back to the, goes back to the second, uh, goes back to the second corps. The only thing is, is that Howard, uh, the 11th corps requests that, uh, the first brigade of, this, of, of Hayes' division stay, uh, stay up there, which was the seventh West Virginia, the uh, eighth Ohio, no, excuse me, the fourth Ohio, and the, I forgot the other one. 14th Indiana. 14th Indiana, you're right, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Okay, yeah. so now, get back to case in point. Very good depiction of how the, pro the fighting was probably done on this part of the battlefield. Most people are used to men fighting in line, nice straight lines, in ranks. Not so here. Especially with the type of fighting as we'll find out as we go along. Chance to introduce you to the two major players here at this part of the line. Joshua Chamberlain, picture over there folks, and then William C. Oates. He's next. Two men that had uh, a lot in common, but then great dis dis discrepancy or disparities. Both men sir, continued to serve their country after the war. Joshua Chamberlain, 
okay, four consecutive one-year terms as Governor of Maine. William C. Yotes, one four-year term as Governor of Alabama. Joshua Chamberlain is Major General in charge of the Maine State Militia. William C. Oates changes color of uniforms in 1898 and is commissioned as a Brigadier of Volunteers during the Spanish-American War and, and commands training camps up on Long Island in New York. That's where the similarities end. Chamberlain is a son of a devout, rock-hard, congregational New England family. Oates is the son of a hard scrabble, rough Alabama farmer who used to take his frustrations out on his wife and kids when he was drunk, which was about 95% of the time. Billy Oates grew up hard. He had to. He learned to use his fists at a very early age. And then, uh, as a very young man, probably not much schooling, um, he gets into fisticuffs with one of the local boys. And at the end of the fight, that local boy didn't get up. And Billy thought he's killed him. And so he leaves town. Figuring the law is going to be after him pretty quick on a murder charge. And he drifts around from, from, from pillar to post and finally winds up in Texas. He makes his way as a card shark, riverboat gambler, and ladies' man. And about two or three years later, his brother Billy, younger brother Billy, shows up and actually finds him and says, Billy, we need you. His brother's name is John, excuse me. Dad's gone. Mom needs you. And so he, he says, by the way, the guy didn't die. All is forgiven. He goes home, does move to another county. And something happens. He either gets religion and meets a good woman or meets a good woman and then gets a religion and decides to settle down and get himself an education. And he passes the bar and becomes, opens up his own, hangs out a shingle as a lawyer. And he's anti-secession, but when Alabama secedes from the Union, he follows his home state and raises a company of infantry for what becomes Company G of the 15th Alabama. His brother is also in the unit. And eventually, by the time the 15th Alabama hits Gettysburg, he's been promoted to colonel of the regiment. When the smoke cleared out of Gettysburg, many a mother wept. For many a good boy died there sure, and the air smelled like death. I am Kilrain of the 20th Maine, and I marched to hell and back again. For Colonel Joshua Chamberlain, we're all going down to Dixieland. And for those of you who don't know who Buster Kilrain was from the movie, he was a fictional character. He was a crusty old Irishman, former armor regular, fought with Scott in Mexico. And the antithesis to Chamberlain's positiveness, his realism balances things off, but the men become in the movie great friends, even though the difference in their ranks. And I wasn't here but I understand that the number one or number two question at the desk here at Gettysburg after the movie was released was, where was Buster Kilrain buried? <laughs> and he's a totally fictional character. Uh, why isn't Buster Kilrain's name on the monument for the 20th Maine? But I can guarantee you one thing, and that somewhere and one of those Irish regiments that fought here at Gettysburg, such as the 69th New York, 63rd New York, 88th New York, 116th Pennsylvania, 28th Massachusetts, 9th Massachusetts, there was somebody that was just <laughs> like Buster Kilrain. Guaranteed. 
I bet my life on it. So let's go down and see what happens here. Okay, folks, kind of, this is what is known as the end of the line. Uh, just to point out a couple of things, we know that the flank markers are in the right, and in the wrong spot. The wall was not here. What we've been able to determine from research is that Chamberlain originally had his line set in the standard Civil War formation of double ranks and then is going to have to change that. While Vincent is placing the troops here, of course, Oates and the 15th Alabama are coming down the crest of Big Round Top. You get a better idea now uh, with the leaves down off the trees, the view shed of the boulders and things like that. Fish in a barrel. The Rebs had no idea the Yankees were up here. And all of a sudden, there's this fire. And then what happens is, that, okay, now the Confederates realize that there's Yankees up there. And again, the advantage in manpower goes to the Confederates, about 450 versus about 350. <coughs> and again, that's even less than that because uh, Chamberlain has sent his largest company, Company B, and a Captain Morrill down to, down, to down to the wall. And Oates is no dummy, so he realizes that what he's gonna have to do is try to get around the flank. And so he has his companies keep on stretching the line around the flank. The approximation of the end of the line at first would have been where the monument is. Now the monument's probably in the wrong spot too. It was probably a little further bit further up, but we're not really and we're not exactly sure. Basically ammunition and a company, extra men. And what it says, my hands are tied. I can't do anything. I can't let you have any help. Well, what I'll do is I'll single up my line. Instead of having two ranks, I'll go down to one. That'll allow me to stretch my line a little bit more to the left, which will let you stretch your line another 12, 15, 20 feet down to the left. And then Chamberlain is going to refuse his line. He's going to bend it back at a 90 degree angle. And approximately where he does that, he's going to single it up, go down to one rank, and he's going to single it up and have it stretch off to the left as the Alabamians keep on trying to get around the flank. And again, it's going to stretch, and it's going to stretch, and it's going to stretch, and it's going to stretch as far as they can. And when he refuses, is that Morrill's men? No, 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 no. The, that that is um, that that's a man of the uh, other companies. So that Morris line is down there. This right. Is up here, and if the Alabamians are going that way, they're getting fire from both sides. <laughs> okay. Some quotes for you. Company uh, uh, Alicia Cohn, private of Company D, which is going to be basically where the monument is. Our regiment was formed in an open level space comparatively free from rocks and bushes, but in our front was a slight descent fringed by ledges of rock, and on our side of the hill was covered with, with boulders. Beyond this line and ledge and other rocks at that time, the eye could not penetrate because of the dense foliage. So one of the things you have here, again, is dense foliage because this is July. Everything's in full leaf, and that's going to provide some protection for the Federals here that the Confederates couldn't see them. Yeah, but it also means that the, the Confederates could be on them faster. Right, true. 
Another quote from Corporal Livermore. He's with a color guard. That's Company F for the 20th. Right where the color guard is going to be right where the monument is after the refusal of the line. By that time, we heard a terrible, terrible musketry on our right, which rolled along, coming nearer and nearer. And what that is is the 47th Alabama has come down on the left flank of the 15th, and they're slamming into the 83rd and parts of the 20 of the 44th. So the line of the line of the 83rd probably crossed the tour road. And this, the line of the 20th Maine went further back towards where the waysides are. And it's, there is a, this Mr. This, uh, Mr. Get, this, uh, uh, Professor Getz talks about possible gaps in the line. He hasn't been able to document it yet, but that's one of the things that's maybe that's coming out. There may have been a few gaps that were been able to be covered obliquely, but there wasn't exactly, you know, uh, uh, man to man. By that time, we heard that terrible musketry on our right, which rolled along, coming nearer and nearer. We were ordered to come to the ready and take good aim when the enemy appeared. Soon, scattering bullets came singing through the trees. I saw a rebel and fired at him. The next instant, a sheet of fire and smoke belts forth from our line. They came within four to six rods. No, rods 15 feet. You guys do the math covering themselves behind big rocks and trees and kept up our murderous fire. Corporal, Corporal Livermore. These photos are from the main, main state archives. Thomas Gerrish, Private Company H of the 20th Maine. Again, back and forth. The line is in the shape of an L. And then is slowly expands and contracts into the shape of a U. And then as more and more Confederates come up and some, some of the Union troops are, are, are killed and wounded, it actually starts to take the shape of a hairpin. And then the Federals will rally and counterattack and then it'll go back into the shape of a U. Never again does it get the way we see it here as a, as a complete L. And the pressure is tremendous. But the Federals are hanging on to what they, what they can. Professor Getz again talks about five to six separate attacks, which were repulsed by the 20th. When the Federals counterattacked, what did they do? They just went back down to recapture the ground they lost. Oh, I see. Okay. They, they, moved down they, they were back, back, back and forth. It's like a bellows. Oh, gotcha. It's like a bellows. They're going back and forth, trying to reoccupy some ground. Oh, okay. Towards the end, back behind us, the rock there, that is known as the Oats Rock. The story is that is where. Colonel Oates's baby brother, who's now commanding Company G of the 15th, is mortally wounded. That's how close the Confederates are. There's a quote from one of the officers in the 20th Maine. He we could walk down that hair inside of that hairpin, and he could touch the shoulders of each soldier on each side. If a rock promised shelter, down went a man behind it. A rifle bar barrel gleamed and flamed above it. Each tree was utilized, for a group, but a great majority of the troops were not thus provided for. As the moments passed, the conflict thickened. The cartridge boxes were pulled around in front and left open. The cartridges were torn out and crowded into the smoking muzzles of the guns with a terrible rapidity. The steel rammers clashed and clanged in barrels heated with burning powder. Private Thomas Gerrish, 20th Maine Infantry, back and forth. The men have been is is issued 60 rounds of ammunition going into the fight. They're starting to run out. 
They're taking ammunition from the dead and wounded on both sides. The weapons used by both sides, the ammunition is almost interchangeable. The 20th Alabama, I mean the 15th Alabama has shot us bolt. If nobody, if we can't take this hill, nobody can. And then Oates is trying to deal with the fact that he's lost his brother. His men, he's lost, uh, he suffered horrendous casualties. Chamberlain, on the other hand, is facing the same thing. My men are running out of ammunition. Some have nothing left. I've been told not to abandon this position. Lieutenant Melcher requests permission from Colonel Chamberlain to take a detail of men and lead an attack to recapture the wounded. Chamberlain goes ahead and agrees and then decides maybe what we ought to do is just go ahead and charge with the bayonet. There is discrepancy as to who ordered the charge. The way the movie makes it sound, I seriously doubt that that was the way it was. There's so much firing, so much confusion, so much screaming, so much yelling. I seriously doubt that one end could hear the, what the, from one end to the other. Chamberlain supposedly calls out bayonets. The men draw their bayonets. Melcher is going to lead his company down the hill to recover those wounded. At the same time, the other side of the line, which is either a hairpin or a U at this point in time, is going to swing around like the gate and start sweeping the Confederates down the hill. Now, where is the company down there? Is that also, I mean, they They're still down there. Now, as those Confederates start retreating, they're going to open up. At that point, they're pulling back. But when, when, when Company B opens up, they figure, we've been surrounded. Now it's time just to, to right. beat feet and get back up the, up the little round top. So those guys have not been so very active? They have not been very active. They're, in, they're not well within range. Okay. And so then basically... So it's actually a smaller segment of the regiment actually bore the brunt of the entire attack. Well, there's more men. There was the largest company down there, but you still you, you take the other nine companies, right. and you're going to have more men. Did Chamberlain just forget about them during the battle? Uh, he's he he he's basically because I think he's just trying to maintain what he's got. Hold his own. Hold his own. He's covering his tush. Probably two and a half hours. Probably two and a half hours. And that pretty much that pretty much mm -hmm. pretty much wraps it up. The Confederates are chased up the up the side of big a big round top. They turn around and give the 20th another blast. Most of these guys are charging with empty muskets. Mm -hmm. They can't fight back, so they pull back down the hill and they reorganize their lines. Now. So, casualties. Everybody wants to know. Everybody wants to know the numbers. Approximately 500 federal, about 650 Confederate. There was about uh, 1,300 men in uh, Vincent's brigade, backed up by about 450 from the uh, from uh, Patty O'Rourke's regiment. Confederates had about. Uh, 1,200 men in the Alabama and the Alabama Brigade, and then about 825 in the Texas Brigade. So we're talking about 2,000. So about uh, 500 and about 650, as far as casualties are concerned. That's killed and mortally wounded. So uh, we started off trying to determine who the hero here is. Vincent. He loses his life here. I think it's a team effort. 
Who? I was like, I'd give it to the team. Team, that's a good, that's a good thought. Anybody, other, any other takers? Anybody for Warren? I had a, one of my first time, I, 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 one of the first times I did this program, I had a visitor pipe up. <clears throat> the man at the end of the line that had nobody on his left flank. <laughs> that had enough faith in his officers, enough faith in his teammates, to use your word, sir, his fellow comrades, his fellow soldiers, his fellow comrades, and himself and his training to be able to know he's the end of the line and stand there and fight and not retreat. That's good. I think that's your hero here, folks. Yeah, that's good. We've gone on for just about an hour and a half. I'm hoarse. And I really, really appreciate you folks coming along on this walk. Uh, thanks for joining me. It's made it, it's been a great run, folks. And I'm, I'm not going to get all emotional right now, but th that's for later. Okay. So, anyway, thanks for coming along, Thank and you. I hope Thank you enjoy your rest of your time here at Gettysburg. Thank you. Thank you.